Welcome to Her Story, the history of Southeast Asia told from her perspective. We'll discover historical figures, meteorical societies, and contemporary female icons, and maybe learn about ourselves along the way. I'm Agas Ramirez. In this episode, we'll meet Queen Indra Devi of the Kamai Civilization, one of Cambodia's first known women poets and the author of the Sanskrit poem inscribed on the steel at the Temple of Timenakas in Siem Reap. Well, this episode is called Idra Devi, the poet queen of Angkor. This really is about three people, Queen Indra Devi, her younger sister, Queen Jayaraja Devi, and their husband, King Jayavarman VII. Together, they formed a sort of royal trinity that transformed Angkor Thom, a metropolis of one million inhabitants in the 12th century. There are hundreds of temples, shrines, and monuments built during the reign of King Jayavarman VII. This includes the well-known Angkor Wat, as well as the complex shrines of the Bayon, Tafrom, Angkor Thom, Freya Khan, and Bantai Chmar. It's difficult to describe the feeling when you first see Angkor Wat. Even after countless photographs and documentaries, walking up to this temple complex at sunrise makes your breath catch in your throat and your eyes water. This magnificent stone structure rises from the jungle floor and there's a long, long wooden walkway over a moat that leads you to the main entrance. As you draw closer, symbols appear, each wall telling you a story. Nothing really prepares you for it. But as magnificent as it is, there really is much more to Siem Reap than Angkor Wat. Of particular significance for our story today is Fimenakas. Fimenakas is a Hindu temple built at the end of the 10th century during the reign of Rajendra Varman. Then completed by Surya Varman I in the shape of a three-tier pyramid as a Hindu temple. On top of the pyramid, there was a tower while on the edge of the top platform, there are galleries. Thimanakas is located inside the walled enclosure of the royal palace of Angkor Thom, north of Bafuwan. On a steel in the foundation of Thimanakas, there is an engraving. The steel is broken and the inscription is badly damaged, but scholars have translated it like this. It starts with an invocation to Trikaya, Buddha, and Lokeshvara, and the eulogy of King Jayavarman VII. It also refers to his first queen, whose name is not clear since only the latter part, Devi, is left. We now know this to be Jayaraja Devi. After her death, King Jayavarman VII married Jayaraja Devi's older sister, Indra Devi. These sisters were the granddaughters of Brahmana named Rudravarman and Rajendra Lakshmi. The younger sister, who had become queen first, actually received education from her older sister, who was a pious Buddhist. Indra Devi actually taught the Buddhist nuns of the convents of Nagendra Tula, Tilakotara, and Narendra Srama. Her scholarship and knowledge of Sanskrit is testified to by the present inscription which was composed by her. In this inscription, she records the pious works and life of her deceased younger sister. This is what you heard in the beginning. The inscription mentions the expedition, and stay with me, of Jayavarman to Champa, and the invasion of Kambuja by the king of Champa, followed by the conquest of Champa by the Kambuja. Here's an excerpt from Trent Walker's translation. In the city named the Temple of Patience, in the city of former eloquence, and eventually in the city of Angkor, this Brahmin girl of royal rank became the beloved of King Jayavarman. Her lowered head on the raised feet of the king she approached the Ganges, whose fallen feet lay on Shiva's head. Among the lovelies who loved learning, she scattered the king's favors, lovely nectars, in the form of learning. Wise by nature, a polymath, perfectly pure, devoted to King Jayavarman, having composed this pure paean at the expense of all other arts, she gleaned. 
According to Sedis, before becoming king, Jayavarman had led the invasion of Champa. In the meantime, there was a revolution against Yasavarman II, the king of Kambuja. Jayavarman returned hurriedly, but the king died. There was a reign of a Chama usurper. Jayavarman had to live in exile, and his queen had a very difficult time. But finally, Jayavarman had his victory and was crowned king of Kambuja. Jayaraja Devi was initiated into Buddhism by her elder sister. She remained in profound religious worship and devotion. She performed a ceremony by which she could see the image of her absent husband. When her husband returned, she increased her charitable works. She made gifts to the principal temples of the kingdom and installed a large number of statues, including those of her parents, relatives, and friends. Jayavarman VII is, of course, a big part of the story, so we need to get to know him and the time they lived in a little better. The name of Jayavarman VII was little known before 1903. The way I guess the greater academic world became acquainted with him is through the Bulletin École Française d'Extrême Orient. They published a study by Louis Fino concerning a Sanskrit inscription discovered by Georges Maspero in the Saifong region of Laos, near Vientiane. This inscription proclaims an edict issued by Jayavarman VII concerning the establishment of a hospital in 1186. Fino noted that this text was very similar to another found on a steel in Natrang province in what is now Vietnam. Fino mentions that Jayavarman VII was often cited in Cham inscriptions as having been a great conqueror. He also noted a number of steels distributed throughout Laos Vietnam and Lower Cochin, China, that attests to conquests and victories. Other inscriptions mention many generous acts and victories of Jayavarman VII. These inscriptions shed light on a great king from Cambodia's distant past. Subsequent research has helped to further eliminate the character of this king, considered to be the most dynamic in Cambodian history. Jayavarman VII became king in 1181 and established a new capital, Angkor Thom. During his reign, the Cambodian kingdom spanned a huge area, extending beyond the Menam Basin to the west. We know this because the Bayan inscription mentions the existence of two statues of divinities guarding the cities of Ratchaburi and Thetburi in Thailand. The territory went as far as the seacoast of Champa to the east and the city of Sukhothai, which was supervised by Khmer functionaries in the north, all the way down to the Southern Sea. At the time, the Khmer's were trading with China, India, and other countries of Asia Minor. King Jayavarman VII was greatly concerned with the well-being of his kingdom and wanted to turn it into an earthly paradise. The Takhrom inscription comments on this subject. He found satisfaction in the nectar of his religion, the Sakyamuni Buddhism of the Greater Vehicle, within which he identified a cult of deceased relatives with the characteristics of the compassionate Bodhisattva and Prajnaparamita. With regard to the arts, the king was responsible for the construction of numerous temples in the Angkor region and in other provinces. The Tapram Temple, constructed at Angkor in 1186 and referred to as the Royal Vihara, was dedicated as a Buddhist temple which housed the statue of Jayavarman VII's mother, represented as Prajnaparamita. Five years later, the king founded Prayakan Temple in order to house a statue of his father in the likeness of Lokeshvara. In the center of Jayatataka Bare, the king erected Nikpian Temple, in which he placed a statue of Buddha the healer and protector against illness. Also in this temple, he placed a statue of his father and a statue of the Buddha. At the end of his reign, Jayavarman constructed the Bayon Temple, which he dedicated to the Buddhist cult of the Buddha Raja instead of the traditional Yinga Raja. These temples I mentioned, Prayakan and Nekpian, they're part of most of the standard tours in Siem Reap. It is well worth enduring Siem Reap's biting bugs, 33 degree heat and 60% humidity to see glory like this. The half-submerged Prasat Nekpian, an ancient hospital with four lotus pattern pools representing the four elements, and a central pool representing balance among them. When we were there, we chanced upon local women making an offering, perhaps just as their ancestors did in the 12th century. But my favorite temple, Prayakan, in all its unrestored charm, with Garudas, Nagas, 
upset as quietly watching your progress through the ruined halls. Jayavarman VII used this temple as a base to raise an army against invaders from the east. Like the nearby Taprom, Priya Khan has been largely left unrestored, and that's what makes it so special. Trees and vegetation grow unchecked among the ruins. I'll share the photos of these temples and others in the Patreon feed. Besides these constructions, the king established a network of roads linking Angkor Thom with Champa, now in Vietnam, and with Phi Mai, now in Thailand. Along these roads, he erected 121 rest houses, one every 15 kilometers. Jayavarman VII also established 102 hospitals throughout the kingdom, so this king took healthcare very seriously. Following the tradition of his father, Jayavarman VII was a Mahayana Buddhist. Nevertheless, throughout his reign, Brahmanism was tolerated because his first wife, Jayarada Devi, had worshipped Buddha, Siva, and Vishnu. The king changed the royal religion from Brahmanism, which had long been the traditional religion, to Mahayana Buddhism, of which the principal divinities are Lokeshvara and Prajnaparamita. About the king, the tenth stanza of the inscription in the Saifong region of Laos reads, Seeing that his kingdom, which his wisdom had transformed into heaven on earth, was oppressed by death, he produced a divine elixir that brought immortality to all. After the break, we'll talk more about the two queens, the sisters Jayaraja Devi and Inda Devi. Hello there, my name is Jinx. And I'm Faith, and together we're the two-woman team of Synchronicity Events PH. Synchronicity Events is an events coordination group that can help you plan and put together celebrations for your life milestones so that you can be worry-free on the actual day itself. Drop us a line on Facebook at Sync Events PH. That's S-Y-N-C Events PH. You can also catch us on YouTube to get some insider info, tips, and trends in the events industry here in the Philippines. Find us, Jinx and Faith, on YouTube as Hustle Girlfriend. Girlfriend spelled as G-F. And don't forget the exclamation point at the end. And see you on our socials. When you look up Indra Devi on the internet, you'd likely get three top results. First is Queen Indra Devi, of course. Second is the yoga pioneer Eugenie Peterson, who went by the name Indra Devi. And the third is the band you just heard. The band Indra Devi describes themselves as Kamai Gumilan Goth Rave. Founders Barong and Randa intertwine Cambodian songwriting sensibilities with influences such as 1980s action movie scores, industrial rock, drum and bass, and Indonesian gamelan music. Vocalist Sophia Pell alternates between English and Kamai. Indra Devi's sound is also heavily inspired by 1970s Cambodian pop. Most artists from this time period were actually killed during the genocide. Sophia Pell herself was displaced during the Civil War, fleeing to Thailand and eventually making her way to the U.S., where the band is now based. In the song Idols, Singer Humani Long, whose background is very similar to Sophia Pell's, is also featured. You can check out the rest of their songs on YouTube. Okay, now back to the real Indra Devi and her sister, Jayaraja Devi. For 150 years, archaeologists and experts have assumed that the images of women lining the walls of Cambodia's temples represented apsaras, imaginary dancers manifested from the churning of a magical sea of milk to entertain in the Hindu god Indra's court in heaven. Kamei American photographer Fali Kang Yin believes that the sister queens of King Jayavarman VII are clearly portrayed by two detailed statues in the heart of Freya Khan. You can see one of the statues in the thumbnail for this episode. In her article in Cambodia Inside magazine, Falika wrote, I believe that as Kamais, with our rich heritage and due respect to our good kings and queens, 
if we had known these as portraits of the two queens, instead of calling them apsaras, hidden in Preakan, endangered by collapsing stone walls, we would have saved their precious sculptures and placed them next to King Jayavarman VII in a museum. The fact that these portraits exist appear to be additional evidence of female power and participation within the government. While Hindu civilizations often limit education to elite men, Jayavarman VII's monasteries were open schools and training centers that welcomed men and women alike. In two illustrations in the Bayon, it appears that Queen Indra Devi and Queen Jayaraja Devi are portrayed as professors teaching groups of students. While Felikanian's research suggests that these images are the queens themselves, the idea of female professors is revolutionary. Queen Indra Devi is also said to have built a vihara. A vihara usually refers to a Buddhist monastery that is inhabited by Buddhist monks. However, the term can have different meanings. For instance, in other religious texts, a vihara refers to a temporary dwelling place for wandering monks seeking refuge or rest during the rainy season. It was called Indra Deviva Vanavihara, but it has not been found. It's perfectly possible that it lies underground in the vast ancient city under present-day Siem Reap. More on that later. In Bayon Temple, the bas-relief on the second floor's inner gallery portrays the royal trio's familial, social, political, and civil activities. In the bas-relief, the queens most frequently appear sitting directly behind the king, tending to affairs of state in their palaces. In one that depicts their romantic and personal lives, the king followed the lead of Queen Jayaraja Devi. On exterior reliefs at the Bayon, the two queens follow the king's processions. In one particular bar relief, one queen sits before the king, with both figures praying for the safety of their soldiers and victory in an upcoming battle. Mahayana Buddhism also plays a role in how they were in life and how they were portrayed. Mahayana Buddhism was infused with respect for women through the goddess Prajnaparamita. The trinity included the Lord Buddha, the Lord Avalokiteshvara, and the goddess Prajnaparamita, the perfection of transcendent wisdom. During their reign, the empowerment of this Trimurti or trinity was represented in bronze statues and extensively carved on the royal trio's monuments. She adds that throughout the empire, the royals repeated their messages, consistently reusing religious iconography showing respect for women, with Prajnaparamita, a female Mahayana Buddhist divinity, standing on equal footing with Lord Avalokiteshvara. This hierarchy is unseen in prior eras, yet here, as Buddhism supplanted Shivaism, the roles of women were raised to equal heights. Remember I mentioned a vast city beneath present-day Siem Reap? Well, in 2016, two archaeologists, Sean Mackey and Kong Lixmi of the Cambodian Archaeological LIDAR Initiative, used LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging, to conduct an aerial survey of the area. LIDAR shoots ultra-quick pulses of light at the ground from lasers mounted on helicopters. The way they bounce back can show the presence of subtle gradations in the landscape, indicating places where past civilizations alter their environment, even if buried beneath thick vegetation or other obstructions. If you are interested in LIDAR, there is a fascinating book, The Lost City of the Monkey God, which details its use in Muskitia, Honduras, where they discovered remnants of a vast city older than the Mayans. They don't even have a name for the civilization yet. Anyway, in Siam Reap, the device led them straight to a field littered with clods of earth and shot through with tractor marks. It looked to the naked eye like an ordinary patch of dirt, but the aerial data had identified it as a site of interest, a mounded embankment where the ancestors of today's Cambodians might have altered the landscape to build their homes. They went to the site and found a small trove of potsherds, celadon pottery, things like this. The result, according to project leader Dr. Damien Evans, has been an unprecedented new understanding of what the Khmer Empire looked like at the apex of its power, with LIDAR-generated maps revealing an intricate urban landscape stretching across several provinces of modern-day Cambodia, along with a sophisticated network of canals, earthworks, and dams that the Angkorians used to control the flow of water. Now it's becoming clearer that there are settlements all around the temples we see today. This is rational, of course. The temples didn't build themselves. 
But with leader-made maps, we can see for the first time an intricate network of houses, gridded streets, tunnels, bridges, and even mud and brick palaces. These were the people who lived under the rule of Jayavarman VII and the queens Jayaraja Devi and Indra Devi. Imagine how much more we'll discover about them through modern technology. People imagined it was a city, but they didn't know how to imagine it because they didn't know what it looked like, said Dr. David Chandler of Monash University. Now they do. This is where Angkorian research is going to go from now on. Research into the people who built the temples, not the people whom it was built for. It's putting the population of the city back in view. They have found some of the first evidence of what Angkorians ate, rice and pomelo fruit, and how they cooked in earth pots over fires. And they have come to understand that the grid-like pattern inside Angkor is just part of a much larger urban setup. The results of the study are also casting doubt on the theory that Angkor Thom was abandoned after the 1431 Thai invasion, because it now seems more likely that the movement out of the city was more gradual. With new technology like LIDAR, we are learning more and more about people behind the monuments, behind the temples. We are going beyond those whose names were important enough to be written down or carved into stone. I have no doubt that these new findings will also change how we understand gender and gender relations throughout her story. Producing a podcast like this takes a lot of time and research. If you like what we do, consider joining our Patreon like Laura, Yadi, Kara, and Mando, who have been supporting this podcast. Give as little as $1 to get a copy of the show notes with all the references, access to the close friends' Instagram stories, a shout-out at the end of the next episode, and the occasional bonus episode. And if you can't join us on Patreon, just tell your friends about this podcast. That works too. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at HerStoryCPod. That's HerStorySEAPod. In the next episode, we'll talk about Princess Ordua of Tawalis, a legendary warrior princess recorded in the travel accounts of Ibn Battuta in the 14th century. This episode will be unique because while Princess Orduha is a popular heroine in the Philippines, we still don't actually know for sure where Tawalisi is. There are so many more stories to tell and we're just getting started. This podcast was written, hosted, and edited by Ada Ramirez. Thank you for listening and we hope to see you again next time. Sampai jumpa lagi!